to be forgotten, JS back to CAD. And so Mark is busy um, tuning up in Manitoba to show us some of the JS to CAD. And Lena here with me in um, beautiful Surrey, British Columbia, is going to be looking at doing CAD to GIS. So just in terms of who we are, uh, I'm Dale Lutz. I'm one of the co-founders of SAFE. Been here for more than 20 years now, so I'm getting a little bit old. Uh, I was just a young lad, really, when the company started. And I'm joined with by Lena, who comes to us. You've been at SAFE how many years? Almost six. And before oh, actually, six already. Six. In September. Wow. And uh, and I know you were a, a Map Info person in your previous uh, life. MicroStation and Map Info, both. Right, so we've got a long time. Like we've got basically three lifers with MicroStation yeah. today. And we introduced Mark. We yeah. We all worked at the same company in uh, Richmond at one point, I'm guessing. All of us are ex yes. We are. Wow, that's yes. just freaky. This is like an episode of Lost. We have all these things <laughs> in common. So um, we've got also a, a panel of experts standing by. Candice is there. Mark Stokes, who brought us our muffins. Thank you, Mark. Um, Dave Campanis, who's a more of an AutoCAD guy, but he also knows his way around MicroStation. He's really a, a CAD of all trades. Uh, and Regan, the lead CAD developer, who looks like he's pressing up against his glass wall there, um, he's uh, standing by. And I was going to make a joke about if you can stump Regan, we'll do something for you uh, with a good CAD question. Uh, but I'll, I'll limit the prize to see who will really stump Regan. So anyway, Regan theoretically is standing by as well to help us. So at any time, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and we're going to be stopping to kind of review them a couple times during the presentation. So. Uh, just out of curiosity, who's new to FME? And if you raise your hand, which is that little um, button there, this is the first time I've ever tried this poll, so let's see what happens when people start raising their hands. Are they ra Oh, there's some. Lane is sorting by the hand raising. So uh, is anybody? Oh, there's a few that are, raised, that are brand new. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, FME is a product that's used to move data between a wide variety of formats and systems. And today we're focusing really on its roots, which was CAD to GIS, and in particular DGN to, um, to GIS. Wow, there's quite a bunch of you that are new. So thanks so much for, for tuning in and letting us know. These links on the bottom, and we'll be mailing these out to you, are great places to go to get some more introductory material on what FME actually is. And you can sign up for a, a kind of a basic intro uh, webinar. Actually, our uh, our statisticians have informed me that about 30% of you are new users, so that is uh, really, really humbling. Thanks so much for tuning in. Kicking off our fall webinar six series uh, as well, so we do these about a couple times a month. So I thought we would jump right in without much more introduction and just get started on a classic old problem. Let's do some CAD to GIS, and we want to extract GIS attributes from CAD properties. And this is a very common, this is really where we started at SAFE and what was the core of how our product really began its life was helping people fish out the actual data that's inside of a CAD file and encoded in there in those bits and bytes of PDP-11 goodness uh, and bring them into something more useful for the GIS technician who isn't as enthusiastic about knowing that color three means that it's a paved road or that the style of one means the road is loose gravel. Um, so we're trying to get that information out and add value to it. And so here's what our map looks like. This is actually one of the first maps we ever worked with at SAFE. And again, um, the graphic group, if you're a microstation person, that was a nice uh, bit of 16 bits there that you could tuck values into, in no sense letting that go to waste. And so people would do things like put, say, the number of lanes in there. Uh, in this example, that's what's the case. Or uh, they might have also put things into the line style, like the road type in this case, where one meant it's a loose road, two means it's paved, three means it's rough. And so we can look at our data like this, um, and we can also see it on top of a background map like that. And so with that, I'm going to try my luck at flipping over here. And this is the FME data inspector, so I've started that up. And I'm just going to show how I would open this up um, I pick my design file, I go to where it was. Um, because MicroStation doesn't know a coordinate system, if I am interested in seeing it on a background map, I need to say the coordinate system. And so I'll do that, and I hit OK. And then this is, again, part of FME. The data inspector runs, and uh, it reads that data in and renders it, and here it is on top of the background map. I can turn off the background map just to see what I've got. 
and then I can go out here and maybe select something. And now here I see all the properties. And my goodness, are there ever lots to choose from uh, when it comes to MicroStation files. These are all the things that we fished out. And at the end, I'll tell you some interesting stories about using the Z or Z value, uh, but I won't get into that now. So anyway, here's all the properties associated. And I can click around on here and see that this one, the style was 2 which again I remember was something. Here's my specifications. Uh, so again, style has the road type and graphic group, the number of lanes. So the number of lanes of that one that I happened to pick was four. And um, that must mean it's a four lane road there. And this is a file that I put together that is a CSV file that maps the style to the road type. And so now I'm going to go and say, great, I've looked at this data. I kind of know what's there. I believe it's the spec. It seems like it lines up with a background map that I configured in my tools options. Um, this one's the MapQuest one, but we have other ones like um, ArcGIS Online is a good one if you're an ArcGIS customer to check if the data is right. And now I'm going to start up Workbench and say, let's translate this into File Geodatabase, doing something useful along the way. And so again, I just drag out my roads DGN onto here. Um, again, because I want to go to the Geodatabase, um, I will tell it the coordinate system. I'll say that's OK. Um, now I've got something that represents the data. This, this file had only one level in it, so I'm seeing just that one level. Uh, and I want to now begin the work of decoding this. And so what I'm going to do is use something called a joiner. And I'm going to go to this joiner and configure it. And it, I, that was a little bit of cooking show magic before that time. I had said that it should look at the um, lookup table.csv. And in this parameters here, I can see that it's got field names on the first row. And here's the data. That looks good. And so that's all happy. I told it to join the style to the style that's inside of that lookup table. And we're going to fish out the road type. And we're doing one-to-one -one match. And that all looks happy. And so now if I open this up, I can see that I've got a road type. And that makes it time for me. If I'm worried about it, I can now do what's called an inspector. And I'll tell this inspector to uh, group by the road type. Here we go. So that when I run this, I'll see different values for the road type. And we will go and run this. And this is a way that I can kind of see if my workflow is working correctly. And um, while it's thinking there, I'm just going to zoom this open. So we can see that we've got a bunch of loose roads, some paved roads and some rough roads. And if I turn these all off, I can start to then see, OK, that's the loose roads. Here's the paved roads. And here are the rough roads. OK. And so that's looking healthy. So I'm happy with that. And so then I'm just down to saying, well, where are we going to output this to? So let's add a writer. And um, I think I'm going to go to File Geo Database. Does that seem good to you, Lena? Yeah. All right. Hey, Dale. Um, yeah. Can Click the browse button next to the formats and show folks um, the list of formats if they're new to FME. Right. There's a lot to choose from. You yeah. are limited by your imagination. And so, um, yeah, so here's, uh, well, actually, if we just type in Esri, uh, there's like a screen full of Esri formats uh, by themselves. Um, and I was picking the geodatabase file. If you're a GML person, look how many you got to pick from there. Um, uh -huh. If you're an AutoCAD person, there's pretty much a screen full of those, too. Um, if you're a web person, you might be doing KML. If you're a Google person, there's lots of Google choices. Uh, who have I left out? Map Info people? Uh-huh. Um, oh, my Intergraph friends. They have a whole uh, bunch as well. Who else? I think that gives folks the idea. There is a lot to pick from, and I've gone for File Geo Database. And I'm just going to put it in this output directory. Yeah, we'll overwrite that thing. And I'll make sure this is set to overwrite. Yep. And we will go like that. And I will add a new feature type, which is a new table. I'm going to call this roads. Um, this is going to hold polylines. With um, going to Ezra, you always have to say that. I'm going to want a couple of attributes. I'm going to go for the road kind, which I'll go make a text type of 30, and the num lanes, number of lanes. We will make that something a bit more interesting. It's a small int. I'm going to be really careful. I'm going to pretend I'm on a PDP 11 and save storage space and go for a small integer there. And then I just take this guy and drag. Whoops, yeah, I don't need that anymore, so I'll get rid of that. 
and I connect this up. And now that thing was red telling me, hey, nothing's going in here, so I want to match the road type to the kind, and I want to match the graphic group to my number of lanes. With that in hand, I run this, and um, this should light up with a bunch of numbers in a moment as we do the work. Yep, all of our data went there. And now I'll just do one last thing. I won't fire up ArcGIS right now because I need to get Lena going, but I'll just do a quick inspect. This is now reading the file geodatabase. And there it is. And here, uh, there we got our background map. And this time I actually have a worthwhile attribute table where I can sort it by the kind, for example. And it was, uh, we should start seeing, yep, some different things or the number of lanes and, um, and so on. So that's really my snap demo. And now I've got myself a file geodatabase that's a whole lot nicer to use than that CAD file was if I was a GIS person. And I think with that, I'll ask our producer to hand the presentation right over to Lena, who will take it from there. OK. There we go. Uh, let's show my screen. And uh, so first of all, let's take a closer look at the differences between CAD and GIS data. The first thing that uh, comes to mind is probably the data structure. Uh, in CAD, the features or objects are usually uh, split into layers or levels, while GIS uh, data structure is more complex. It might uh, include additional rules, and um, we probably missed a poll question. Uh oh. <laughs> Should we get back to the poll question now? What was the poll question? Sure, we can do the poll. Yeah, let's Sorry, do Lena. the poll first, and we will get back to the slide. Right. Here we go. Yeah, we wanted to also ask you, now that you've seen kind of what's possible, what are the things you might want to do when you're coming from CAD to JS? And as Lena was saying, while we're taking the poll, we can actually talk about some of these things. The CAD is a visual-oriented thing. There's annotations as opposed to attributes generally. There are ways of tucking attributes in, but they're more mm -hmm. tricky. On the JS side, really, it's all full attributes. And the visualization side, for the most part, is much more limited. Yeah, so for the CAD, uh, additional information is coded as, as visual attributes uh, quite often, as we were talking about uh, line styles, for example. Yes. While in, uh, it was in, uh, in CAD. In JS, it would be attributes or... Sure, and in CAD, you'd have a little picture of a dog barking um, <laughs> to represent a dog park. But in the GIS, maybe you'd have a point. Um, yeah. And you wouldn't want the dog barking in the GIS. No, definitely. Right. And the coordinate systems, I know um, some, uh, I remember actually a map info user called me years ago and said, Dale, your, uh, your, your CAD file reader is incorrect because it's not giving me the coordinate system. They've never, because they're from map info, they never imagined you could have a GIS file without a coordinate system. And so yeah. I explained to them that there wasn't a coordinate system in these things. You have to know it. And the person was kind of sad and then said, this is going to be a big problem. And they were right. <laughs> so um, Yeah, it is quite often. So there we're showing the results. So actually, good thing, a lot of people interested in, uh, in getting the attributes out of CAD, which is really what we're mostly focusing mm -hmm. on. Yes. And fitting the CAD into the GIS. There you can all see it. And then going back the other way, uh, that's what Mark's going to be talking about. There's a, still a sizable chunk that want to do that as well. So that's great. And so with that, I think we can mm -hmm. go back uh, and um, let's see. Lana, you need to share your screen. There we go. It's, you're, you're in business. Am I? Oh, yeah. OK, good. Uh, so uh, let's go uh, straight uh, to one of the uh, demonstrations that we have. Um, we uh, will take a look at the data. Uh, these are parcels and blocks and parcel numbers and block numbers. Um, as a JS person, uh, what I would expect, I would expect to have some polygons and uh, some attributes as a block and poly uh, parcel number attached to them. As a matter of fact, what I've got from CAD data are boundaries. These segments are boundary, uh, parts of the parcel and block uh, boundaries. So to transfer this CAD data into GIS, what uh, would we need to do? First of all, we would need to uh, create polygons. Uh, then uh, we would need to attach uh, information about these numbers to the created uh, polygons. And this is how we would do that. 
So this is the workspace that that would do the trick for us. Um, let's see what it does. Uh, first of all, we are reading uh, our CAD data. It was a DGN format, and the data was uh, split into levels. Uh, we had a separate level for parcel boundaries, another level for the block boundaries, one level for parcel numbers, and another level for the block numbers. So first of all, we would probably want to create our polygons. And this can be done with a transformer that is called Polygon Builder. The only problem was when we started to build these polygons, we realized that the uh, boundaries are not topologically correct. No. No. Is it really true that there's bad data? No, there is no bad data. There, there is a data that we have to deal with, and we just need it's to. It's not make really it. bad. You have to just look at the good part of it. Yes. <laughs> and get the good part out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Definitely. Yeah, and we person. definitely can do that. Uh, we have another transformer that is called Snapper that would snap the uh, ends of the lines for us. After the uh, lines were snapped together, we can build the polygons. Yes. And that, yeah, I'll just ahead. mention, um, if people need even higher end cleaning, there is a, an extra cost thing you can buy for mm -hmm. me called the MRF Cleaner that uses technology from a company that's been around for a long time to do very complex cleaning. This is just simple snapping, yeah. but that's actually adequate for many situations. Yeah, in many cases you, you would need to know uh, how to approach the cleaning because there is no tool that would do the clean for all kinds of situation, but you can do a lot with FME. Um, so next step. Next step, uh, we would like to uh, merge the data from the text uh, numbers uh, with the polygons. And in this case, the uh, spatial relationship was quite simple. If we take another look at the data, we can see that Every parcel number is uh, inside the polygon, and every block number is inside the block. Uh, for this uh, relationship, we have point on area over layer. However, the first step uh, we would have to do would be to create uh, an, a user attribute that would carry the uh, block ID or parcel ID. And uh, how would we do that? Um, Dale has mentioned uh, that uh, there are lots of tons of format attributes uh, read with every data, and uh, those format attributes can also be used by the writer if you write uh, when you write in a, uh, some kind of format. Uh, you can see all those uh, format attributes as a long list. But in this case, we would need uh, to extract a text string from the text features. Yes. And the attribute is called, in this case, uh, the data is coming from DGN, so the attribute is called IGDS text string, and uh, we will rename this attribute into block ID for blocks and into parcel ID for parcels. After that, we can merge the text with the polygons, and the user attribute we just created would be transferred onto polygons. Then we write the data. In this case, I also somehow, uh, we were thinking alike, and I also <laughs> picked a geodatabase as a destination format. We can uh, take a look at the result, and this is what we've got. So these are parcels and blocks in our uh, file geodatabase with information about block ID and parcel ID attached. You know, we should mention, I don't know if this data is like this, but these nice cul-de-sacs, if those were arcs, that would come through as arcs um, if you're going to file a geodatabase. I don't know if this data was like that, but I think that, yeah, I don't know whether... But anyway, it does sure, work, yeah. and the snapper works with arcs, and the MRF yes. cleaner works with arcs. So FME's geometry model is, is sort of CAD-friendly. Uh, but having said that, I also think that most of the world's data has made one trip through a shapefile at least sometime in its life, and shapefile don't do arcs. Um, and so that, uh, that means that it probably gets stroked out in that case. But yeah, quite often we get uh, 
portfolio lines instead of arcs. Yes, but, but file due database would do arcs yeah. with no problem. Um, uh, we have mentioned that uh, uh, visual attributes like line styles are, and uh, fonts and symbols are not that important for GIS and actually are not supported for, uh, by some of the GIS formats. And file geodatabase is one of those formats. However, there are formats that do support visual attributes. Let's uh, try to write into MapInfo instead of uh, file geodatabase. We will add another writer, and it will be one of the MapInfo writers. And the output will go into this folder. Um, I will not create any destination feature types uh, right now. What I will do instead, I will change the writer. Uh, so far we were writing into Cold Lake Geodatabase. Now we will write into MapInfo tab. And this will be MapInfo tab as well. Uh, the uh, data structure stays pretty much the same, although you mentioned that allowed geometries yes. disappeared. It's because MapInfo can support multiple geometry types in, in the same table, while Geodatabase requires only one uh, geometry type per feature class. Um, as we are writing into MapInfo, we probably do care about uh, styles now. Uh, you can set uh, the styles of the objects using uh, MapInfo format attributes, but there is an easier way to do that. We have another transformer that is called MapInfo Styler. Let's add it on the way to the writer, and let's check its parameters. Uh, in this case, uh, we are writing polygons only, so we would like to set the style for the regions. Uh, first of all, nice feature, you can uh, select one of the MapInfo patterns. You don't need to know the number. You have uh, the interface that is similar to MapInfo interface, and you can uh, select from the list, let's say, this one. Uh, you can set the color. Uh, you can set, in this case, uh, background color. I think we will get something orangey. Um, another one on the way to writing blocks, and let's do the same. Uh, let's take another style, I think this one, and let's do the blocks nice and green. Uh, let's run this translation. Uh, nice uh, FME 2015 feature. You see the number of features uh, going through these links, so it's it's done. It's wow, that fast! Very fast. Yeah, but it was uh, really fun to watch how features are uh, going from the reader to the writer. Yes. And let's take a look at our data in uh, Mapping Fun. We're kind of having a gratuitous set of demos of different JS software today too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, looks nice and red. So these are parcels. These are our green blocks. Yeah, blocks yeah, are green, yeah. and uh, these are parcels. You can see. Yes. Or you can see, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. The data. Yeah. The in a browser. Yeah. Yeah. So this is it with this uh, gemma. Um, Let's move to the next piece of data that we would like to convert into from CAD into JS. This one is uh, more complex. This, uh, as you can see, this is a, I would say, typical topo map, uh, and it was created uh, using MicroStation. Maybe even not. Maybe it even came from somewhere else, um, because I see actually some problems that probably were created while importing the data. Okay. Um, so what do we have here? We have uh, elevation points, like this one. And uh, while the point uh, sounds like it's supposed to be a point, this point is actually a circle <laughs> with 
it's uh, all the data, as you can see, it's a 2D file. So there is no elevation on the circle. Instead, elevation is written as a text next to the point. And we can't even expect it to be on the same side. As you can see, sometimes it's to the left, sometimes it's to the right. Uh, any, anyway, it's somewhere close to the circle. Uh, elevation lines, uh, they are also 2D. And they even have gaps in them with elevation written in the gap. And again, this uh, elevation text is uh, not linked anyhow to the line. Uh, on top of that, there is a bunch of cells. Some of them we probably want to use somehow. Some, some of them we might not care about. But um, they are cells, and uh, we need to uh, convert them somehow into GIS. Some cells we really probably care about it's single trees. Uh, it's probably some kind of object. Another uh, piece of data uh, hidden somewhere here. Um, these are, I'm trying to find the right spot. These are different fences. Like this is one of the fences, and the type of the fence is coded as line style, as a custom line style. So we would need to extract this information somehow. Uh, let's take a look at the workspace that will process this. So first of all, let's deal with the elevation points. Uh, elevation points, all of them are stored on the level that is named elevation points. So we read this level. Uh, there is something else, uh, uh, some other features uh, on this level that we don't care about. So first of all, we will filter ellipses and text only uh, to process them. Uh, next step that we would do, we would need to attach the elevation information to the circle somehow. And in this case, the spatial relation is more complex, but it can be done with neighbor finder. After the neighbors, uh, neighboring uh, circles and text are found, we would need to create uh, again uh, the user attribute, and again it's stored in IGDS text string that comes from the uh, text features. After that, uh, we would like uh, to uh, convert the circles into appropriate uh, geometry type. And in this case, we uh, talked about points. So we would uh, create, uh, replace this uh, ellipses uh, or circles with points. And also, what we would like to do, we would definitely want uh, elevation points to be 3D. So with using 3D forces transformer, we would uh, add the third coordinate to them. And after that, we are writing again into file geodatabase. It can be another format. Uh, just happened that we happen to uh, decide to go with the geodatabase time after time. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we are done with this part. Next one will be even more complicated part with elevation lines. So again, elevation lines are stored on a separate level, and it's called elevation lines, which is nice. And we only need from this level lines and text. The rest, we for now, we would discard. Um, again, we are creating uh, elevation uh, attribute based on FME text string or IGDS text string. It's the same thing. Then what we would do. We would need to get rid of the gaps. Let's take another look at the uh, elevation lines. Let's find a good gap and zoom oh, close to there's it. There's gaps in them. Yeah. Oh, right there. The, these are. This is a piece of elevation line. This is another piece of the same elevation line. And this is the gap between them. I, mind the gap. Yeah, mind the gap. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, let's fix this. What we would do, uh, as you can see, uh, there is a text uh, sitting kind of in the middle of the gap. So let's convert this text into a point. 
then we would uh, find the rotational vertex, we would create a small short line that would be a patch for the elevation line. This is done with these uh, several transformers. We are calculating the coordinates of the text, then we find the rotation of the text and add another coordinate in a certain direction and extend the point into line. After that, we would like to use the snapper again. We have our elevation lines and those short lines that are like patches, and we would like to snap them together. And uh, after that, we can join the elevation lines to have one uh, elevation line uh, instead of pieces. That removes the pseudo nodes. There's an old term that was used here. I, I wonder who out there ever heard pseudo nodes, but basically it means that lines are broken for no reason. There's no reason oh. for them to be broken. Yeah, absolutely no reason to be broken from GIS point of view. Right, so let's join them together. That's happier for everybody. Yeah, and also what happens when we join the lines, we transfer the elevation from those tiny short patches onto whole lines. Yes. And after that, the whole lines can be written again into our destination format, in this case, elevation lines. And you have elevation now. Yeah, unfortunately the data is incomplete, we can try to fix it even more, yes. yeah. but there are not all the lines, not all, all the parts of the lines have elevation on them. Yes. And it's a quite complex... Uh, uh, yeah, but we, can, but, but we can get you know 80% of the stuff automatically and then somebody has yeah. to go and clean it up. And that's a lot of times when you're doing CAD to GIS, you automate a big chunk of it, and a human has to go mop it up at the end, just be, depending on how good or bad the data was to begin with. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and the last thing, uh, we should try to do some kind of feature classification. We have another uh, level in this DGN file, and it's called Topa. Yeah. And there is uh, actually all the rest of the map is uh, all together on this level. We have some cells on that level. We have some lines with line styles on the same level and it's totally not appropriate for a GIS format, especially for a uh, file J database. So first of all, let's try to separate all the cells and we can separate them uh, and code them um, based on the cell name. Uh, we have again, we have a very useful attribute read from the source data and it's called IGDS cell name. Yeah. And we know that uh, we can actually import those values from the source file, which is also very convenient. You don't need to type all of them. Right. So we're going to get point features and then we know that they, what kind of cell they were and then you can save that if you want to. Yeah. And in this case, we would like to create on our output, we would like to have a, a user attribute called symbol type with the name of the cell in it. Because then someone can set up rules inside of ArcGIS to make them display yeah, nicely. Yeah, and we will, yeah, we will see that. Okay. And the last one, let's uh, try to write all the fences separately. And uh, with fences, we have different custom line style. And we have a nice attribute called IGDS style name. Again, uh, we will Read all those lines by... It looks Greek, but it's not, is it? No, it's <laughs> Russian. <laughs> okay. I'm, not, I'm surprised. Uh, this uh, proves that we do support different yes, coins. Um, I know. Yeah. Uh, so this one, this is even more complex. We were talking about some additional rules that might um, oh. be implemented yes. in the destination format. And in this case... Uh, the fence type is actually a coded domain. Wow, okay. And uh, while we transfer just the integer numbers yeah. and write integer numbers, yeah. in the destination uh, file of the database, we will see uh, those fence types as nice words. So you're translating file formats and language. Yeah. And code numbers. There's yes. like three translations going on at once. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we won't run this translation, but we will open uh, this uh, data in uh, So it's like app. a cooking show. And we're back. And mm -hmm. we have our... And this is what we were talking about. Uh, 
as uh, file Geo database doesn't support uh, styles, yeah. we didn't write any visual styles, uh, any attributes that would uh, transfer the styles. However, we had some values written into user attributes, yes. and based on those values, we display the features differently. Uh, these are the bushes. These are the some kind of grasses. There are some trees. As you can find, those were the cells that we classified. Um, these are our elevations. And um, if we check on information about the elevation, we will see that the elevation value is written into the attribute. Also, there are all different types of fences, and they, in this case, um, I, we didn't find uh, good enough uh, line styles. They just displayed with different colors. Yes. So I think we achieved what we had to. Yes. It's always nice to see a nice looking map. So is that the end of your demos? Yes. Then we should probably switch to queries. Right. So we'll ask some questions, questions. or ans answers, not ask. We'll answer some questions here for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll hand it over to Mark. So um, I was uh, watching the questions while mm -hmm. Lena was talking there. And um, so Stephanie, if you want to switch the presenter over to Mark, that would be a good thing to do. But what someone was asking about different dialects of design files. Uh, like MGE, do you ever did you ever work with MGE in your life? Uh, I know what it is, <laughs> and I was happy not to. <laughs> yeah, okay, but yeah, Stephanie out of the box can read MGE with no problems. Um, MGDM, I, I have a feeling I know who that is because I haven't heard of MGDM for about ten years, and now within three days I've had several queries. But yes, MGDM was a, a, an extension of MGE, which not only created linkages from the design file elements to a database, but also maintained history. So all the deleted elements are still in there, in the file. They don't get displayed, but you can see them. And yes, FME can read the deleted elements out as well. And then, of course, frame or from A, as we say in Canada. Um, yes, frame data can be read. Uh, when, you're, when you're reading a frame file, we fish out the UFID and some of those things uh, so you can join to a database. I know Mark Stokes, has uh, he loves doing frame. Uh, imports and we've been involved in many frame to small world frame to G technology these kinds of things um, someone else asked about projections and yes if you don't have a projection it can be a problem um, you have to talk to somebody if you can identify tie points FME has a warper in there that we could warp things for you we can do a fine transformations but there's no substitute for elbow grease using the background map and the data inspector you can tell if you're in the ballpark but in the end, there's no magic wand. Um, you have to figure that out. And if you have a custom coordinate system, yes, FME has about seven or 8,000 coordinate systems in it, but you can also define your own. And so those are the questions that I uh, picked out. Do you have anything else that you noticed, Mark, uh, before we hand it over to you to go the other direction? No, but I, I, I mean, I would mention there's the offsetter and scalar transformers as well. So yes. you can, if you know a certain offset or a certain scaling factor that's being applied to your data, then uh, in, in a local coordinate system, then you can apply them in FME as you translate the data. Right. There's often unit troubles, for example, the CAD files in millimeters, and you need meters. Uh, we didn't even talk about the joy of subunits. Uh, oh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> you can work with them. So. You can. If you really love subunits, uh, if you know what that means, you're in an elite group in this webinar. Uh, but yes, the, and half the, half the files have meters as subunits in British Columbia, and half of them um, have millimeters, so you have to kind of be on your on your toes. It's when you're okay. With it's that. worse when it's feet and meters. Ah, come That's on. Our it. American friends, they love feet because then they can choose from survey feet or international feet. There's yeah. so many feet to choose from um, as well. So anyway, all those things are possible. Mark, should, do you want to take it away and uh, and guide sure. us now as we go back the other direction? So you got some GIS data. You want to make a beautiful CAD file That's because right. that's where Mark likes to live. Can I just check with our organizer that? Everyone seeing my screen right now, and that's. We are. You've got a nice big Q and A through a magnifying glass. Okay, and now you should be seeing that slide. Okay, yeah, perfect. Problem. Okay, so the the thing we're looking at here is um, we've got some data. It's stored in our GIS system. It's shape files, and how do we represent some of the information in that shape file in a CAD data set? And so I'll just fire up uh, ArcMap or open up ArcMap. I've already got it open here. And we have this the exact scenario that Dale was talking about earlier. We have 
these features in the city of Vancouver, which are parks, and the little red dots indicate that it's a dog off-leash park. So we have a combination of area features, polygon features, whatever you want to call them, and point features as well. And if I zoom into one of these point features and query it, hopefully you can see that there's a couple of attributes on there. There's the park name and there's a number of hours that the park is open. So we've got different geometries, uh, attributes to deal with as well, and the fact it's a point feature, well, we should really represent that as a cell when we rate that data out into uh, into our microstation. A barking output. dog? Yes. And we do have a dog cell. I don't think it barks at you, but... Um... Dog gone, you do. Okay, so I'm going to open up Workbench. So right now for me, Workbench again, and I'm going to create this workspace from scratch to translate this data. So we're going to translate the data with this Generate Workspace option and our source data is shape format. So I'm just going to type in shape and select the data sets I'm working with, which are, let's see, in my Dropbox, demo, demo four, here we go. So we've got a few different things. I'm going to work with the off-leash parks and the park polygons. So I'm selecting those two shape files to read. Obviously, the uh, output format is going to be a microstation. So I set that. I'm going to write to version 8. Um, the data set we'll write it out to. Uh, let's see. We'll write it to that folder. It's already got a parks.dgn, so I'm going to call it parks2.dgn. If I click in the parameters button here, you can see that we've got all these different parameters that we can set when we're writing uh, a microstation file. For example, we can set the seed file. This is going to be two-dimensional data, so I'm going to change the uh, seed file from a 3D one to a 2D one. Uh, and FME comes with a whole bunch of seed files uh, predefined for 2D, 3D, feet, meters, version 7, version 8. So I'm picking 2D in meters, version 8. I've got a cell library I'm going to use. Uh, again, FME comes with a couple of cell libraries. I'm going to use uh, the one that's in my Dropbox, and it's Park Cell Library. And I can also set the, master, the output units to be master or subunits, and uh, I've got different options there for, uh, for handling uh, different uh, components uh, in my output microstation. So I'm going to click OK, and FME is going to scan the source data, tell me what the source layers are, and set me up this translation, which is basically going to be the two layers on the left, my shape files, and the two items on the right are my levels in microstation. So, and we can see if I click the expand button, we've got some uh, attributes in there. So, how am I going to get the attributes uh, in uh, into microstation? Because microstation doesn't really have attributes that are attached to features. It has what we call tags. And so if we look, I'm just going to zoom in a bit so you can see that because I'm probably, uh, there we go. So if we look in this navigator window in the left, I'll expand that. There's some more settings that control how uh, the microstation data is created. Again, we can set the subunits, the, uh, the type three elements, if we're going to write those or not. Uh, we let FME compute its own seed file if we want. Um, the key one I'm looking at here is write tags, uh, yes or no. So I'm going to say yes to that. And when I say yes to that, any incoming attributes like the park and the hours, it's open, are uh, going to be written as tags in the output. So that's uh, solved uh, the, uh, the attribute problem. Okay, so what I can do now is start adding a few transformers in to, uh, to transform the data to write it to the output. And one of the transformers we have is called a DGN styler. And a DGN styler is the way that we can set a different symbology for the features that we're writing out to uh, MicroStation. So if I open this up and have a look, um, let's see, we've got color. Let me just expand that a little bit. Well, we have color and line style. I'm not going to write cells for the part polygons itself, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ignore that. 
So we can set color as being by level if we wanted to. It's only for version 8, but I'm not going to do that for now. But that is a possibility to, uh, to do that. Uh, we can set the color type. I'm going to go with color index. In other words, use microstation colors. And let's see, color 0 for the outlines, which is black. And color, fill colors 2 is green, I think, isn't it? So there we go. So I'm just saying for these polygon features, set it to an outline that's black and, a, and or white on a black background and uh, with a green fill. I'm going to put another DGN styler here. And what this is going to do is let me set cells for the dog symbols. So let me just put a check mark against the cells, expand that dialog. Okay, so, so well, which cell library are you going to use? Again, I'm going to browse to the, the one I had earlier. The cell name, I can click OK on that, open it up. And what FME will do, FME will do is it will scan through that cell file, find a list of all the cells in there, and let me select which cell I want to write. And in this case, it's going to be one called Doggy Park. I get to choose which the... Uh, the cell mode is so it can be shared or it can be the library itself so each instance is itself separate rather than shared. We can write graphic cells, relative graphic cells, all the different sorts of cell types and it gets very confusing um, uh, all the different cells that you can have in MicroStation but uh, FME does support writing uh, all of those. And we can si create the cell size by a scale factor of the original cell or we can set master units which is what I'm going to do here. So we can say the master unit is going to be 50. Now I'm typing them in manually there, but if there was an attribute um, I wanted to set it by, so I could say set that by attribute value, the number of hours that the park is open. So the in that case, the, uh, the cell would be larger the more hours the park was open. The fewer the hours it was open, the smaller the cell would be. I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to set it to a uh, fixed value. But that's one way we can... Um, increase and decrease the size uh, in uh, the MicroStation output. Um, I did see a question about how you would uh, change the output level. Um, what I would do is on the right hand side just click on this button and say well I want to change the name from dog off leash areas to dog parks and that's all I need to do. If I change that now my level is being changed, the name has been changed uh, and I should probably rename this as well, because Park Polygons isn't really a great um, level name. So we can do that, and I can rename them like that. And yeah, so let's see. Well, we'll, we'll run this uh, translation, and you can see in the log window it's running, and yep, there we go. took one second to translate 250-odd features there. Okay, so let's open that up and see what we got. So here's MicroStation, there's parks2.dgn. We'll open it up. And we'll need to maximize that window and fit everything into that window. And also, I guess, we'll need to turn on the fill to make sure we see it in green. So there we go. I turn on the fill, there it is. So now I can zoom into this. Now where would my cells be? Maybe they ended up underneath. That would be unfortunate. Let's see. Anyway, we can see the uh, the, the levels there, the parks. Uh, I'm going to turn off the, uh, the fill again just so I can see. There we go. There's the, uh, the cell with a little doggy symbol there. So we've got the cell that's made up there and that was a... Uh, let's see, we'll query that. So that was a graphic cell. Um, if I use the tags dialog, where well, there's the tags, I click the review, review tool, query the tags, and we'll see that the attributes that were on that data, the park name, and the number of hours, uh, that's come through as uh, a series of tags on, uh, on that data there. So that's so Mark, I guess if you wanted to control display order, you could hold all the cells to the end and then have them written out at the end, because in CAD files, the order that stuff is written does matter, I guess. That's right, yes. And so... Um, also, for DGN, we have a priority attribute. Okay. Yes, and I was just going to say, there's a whole bunch of different attributes you can see on the, um, on the feature type here, which give you a bit more control over things um, that you don't have 
uh, all exposed in the DGN styler. So we can look through some of these format attributes and um, they'll be in there. So you said there was a priority one there, Lena? I don't see that, but I could just be... Um... Oh, there we go, IGDS element priority. So we could expose that and we can we can right click and say, edit the value of that and set it to a value of one and set the other one to a value of two or zero or whatever would um, would get that in the right order. And the other thing we could do is, for example, I could put a label uh, on there as well. So I could say, well, let's, we've got these um, there, let's create a label. Um, I'm going to create a new level to put those on and we'll call it uh, labels. And we're just, I'm just changing that and creating a label out of it. And we, again, I could get that from an attribute. In fact, why don't I do that? We'll put the park name as a uh, as a label, and the label can be say 50 units high. And we'll probably, I'm going to use the offset of transformer just to offset it by 50 units. Uh, well, I say 20 units in each direction. Now we'll say 50. What the heck? And see what that looks like. So now I just got to go back to MicroStation and close that file because FME won't like it if I try to overwrite a file that's open. And okay, let's go back into that. Let's have a look if we've got some labels, which we should do. So there we go. So now we've got a label in there as well with the name of the park. Uh, so each park will have its own label now. So that was just a very quick example of um, translating from uh, shape into uh, MicroStation. And there's a whole bunch more we could do, but I can't really, I don't want to go into too much detail right now. So that was that problem. The next problem I wanted to look at very quickly because we're running out of time was three-dimensional data. And in this case, what I've got is I've got a bunch of building footprints and I have some LiDAR data. And basically, I want to process that data to, I'm going to use the LiDAR to give height to my buildings and then extrude them to that and write it out to um, uh, well, whatever format I like. And I've already got a workspace made up that did that. Uh, so I'm going to click the run button because this will take about a minute or so to run. So what's happening here? Well, I'm reading some point cloud data. I'm splitting it up based on the the classification value. So in this case, classification one is vegetation, six is a building. So I'm splitting it up by classification and keeping all the building um, points, um, thinning it out a bit because we don't really need as, as many points as we have. And it'll just make this for workspace run a bit quicker. Uh, this is where the building footprints are being read. These are microstation uh, footprints, uh, polygon features. So the key point here is the uh, point and area overlay. We're overlaying the point cloud onto the building footprints, and that gives the footprint an elevation. And we basically pick the highest elevation out of those. So we say whichever point is the highest in the point cloud, that's going to be the height of that building. And then we're going to use the extruder transformer, which just says, OK, turn that flat two-dimensional polygon into a three-dimensional solid. And then we're going to write that out to MicroStation as well. And we're also um, going to send it to the FME uh, data inspector so we can have a look at the data in there and make sure everything's OK. So that should just take another few seconds to complete. We're 70, 90% of the way there. So there we go. We're just finishing it. So there's a translation. Let's have a look. In the data inspector, the data is just coming up now. So this should be our 3D buildings created from two-dimensional um, building footprints with some LiDAR data thrown in there to extrude that. Um, so that's in uh, in FME, in the data inspector. Um, so in my 3D PDF or to ArcGIS or whatever. That's right. I was going to open it in MicroStation, but also we can uh, look at it in 3D PDF, like you say. So I, I did that earlier. I ran that earlier um, and 
opened it. I could open that up in 3D PDF and show you that. So let's have a look at that. So this is what it looks like in 3D PDF, which I, a format I really love and not many people know about. Like, who would know that you could open this up in a PDF file? Um, not many people, I don't think. Um, also, I wrote it out to a geodatabase, so let's have a look at it in an scene. Uh, let's see. Demo, demo 5, geodatabase buildings, and there we are in arc scene. So we've got the data written out to that. So we started out in MicroStation, we wrote it out to PDF, um, geodatabase, also MicroStation as well, so I could open that up in MicroStation if I wanted to and show that in 3D. The other thing I was messing about uh, while they were doing, Lena was doing her demos earlier was uh, adding some appearances to that. I, yeah. I, could, I couldn't find a really good appearance to add, so I just threw a photo of myself in there, um, put it on the appearance. So appearance setter just adds um, a texture to our three-dimensional data. I ran that translation earlier, and I got this rather horrific-looking uh, outline of Vancouver. It's Markville. It is. I've got to say that BC Place would look so much better with my face across the top of it. <laughs> it just looks awesome. So, okay, okay that, that wasn't a very good texture, but you get the idea, I hope, that you can apply uh, textures to uh, features. And that workspace took me about 15 to 20 minutes to create. It wasn't long. So once you're familiar with FME, um, and I've not, I'm not, no longer the presenter, so I guess I was running over time. So I'll <laughs> hand it back to uh, to uh, you guys. So who is the presenter? Is it me, Stephanie? Let's see. I don't know why Mark got kicked off. Well, we're going to wrap it up here anyway. And with luck, Stephanie's going to make me the presenter in a moment here. Let's see what I have to do. Yes, whoops. I have to do that. And um, then I do this. Okay, so that should be good. Yes, so we're out of time. So we'll just mention that, of course, we can reproject. We can connect to databases. I did a join. We can use the SQL executor. Yes, and of course, all this stuff you saw today can be automated in batch modes, in server modes. We have all kinds of automation tools. A key part of our, our technology offering is that you set this up and then run it over and over again on directory fulls of files. We've got a couple other webinars coming up. If you like what you saw today, we're going to be doing a similar kind of thing with raster. Um, this is going to be a different webinar than our usual raster because we're going to dig into specific um, customer success stories that we think integrate a bunch of interesting raster options. And then on October 15th, we're talking to some friends in the utilities um, as well about how they've been using FME there. So that's going to be focused more on utility, utility kind of workflows. And we always have free training for you to try. If you go to safe.com slash training, you can sign up there. We have various online options where there's an instructor. We give you an a Amazon machine for you to play with, with all the software, and you can do both desktop as well as server. We've got an advanced one coming up. Mark, that's exciting. What's, what's some of the stuff in the advanced one? Oh, you just put me on the spot. Uh, performance is the uh, one of the big ones. How do you get the maximum performance out of your uh, data translations? Yes. Uh, that's a really, uh, really important chapter on that, I think. And then there's yeah. the event schema mapping as well and things like that, so right. and, uh, attribute handling and uh, right. everything. For those that don't so. know, Mark is our uh, training architect and is the man behind the materials uh, that are presented here. Are you presenting the advanced one yourself, Mark? I suspect I probably will be, yes, yeah. or at least part of it. So that so, sweet uh, molasses voice will be there two days in a row and during those dreary days of October for you right. to tune into. So anyway, with that, we'll just uh, basically I'll, I'll say goodbye to people. We'll hang around and do questions and answers, but I do know that we're at the, at the witching hour of 9. So thanks so much for joining us. We're going to hang around and answer some questions, throw in the cameras and kind of go through some things if you have to leave. Thanks so much for spending time with us. And don't be afraid to be in touch with us at uh, info at safe.com. Uh, there will be a follow-up email with links to all this stuff that uh, you can look at afterwards. And we do, we, we basically love, our passion is solving people's data translation problems. And we, we just love the, the gnarlier the better. Uh, and we'll sit around here and tell some more stories in a few minutes. But, uh, but that's what gets us up in the morning. That's what gets us here at SAFE, so don't be afraid to ask us. And there really are no gnarlier translation problems than those that involve GGN files. And so um, 
you are all of you that attended this are part of a very elite group that, uh, that know and love that. So I think uh, we'll say goodbye and then we'll look at some um, questions and answers. So let's see what uh, what we got. I'm going to share my webcam. Thank you, Stephanie, for doing that. So, um, Mark, any other things that you wanted to add on? I don't think so. No, I think I'd uh, I'd pretty much covered uh, what I wanted to do. So. Um, so yeah. um, there was someone that asked me, or the actually we have someone from Esri online. So thanks very much for that. And they uh, said that if some people want some general tips about dealing with things that don't have a coordinate system, I'm just going to send out a link to an Esri knowledge base article there. That um, of course it's ArcGIS centric, but the principles are um, are sound that some of you may. Um, we may want to look at. Uh, this is actually the article there. So in terms of other um, questions... Someone was uh, asking about reference files and if we could read reference files, which we can. Yes, that must be... Yes. Uh, if we go to the... If, actually, let's just look. If we add an, a MicroStation reader... Yeah, I'll there's, there's definitely... A... Are people seeing me? Yeah. Somewhere in here there's a thing about following. Yeah, read reference files. Here we go. So you can read the first one, or just or keep crawling through them and yes. add infinitum and as far as you want. Yes. And isn't it fun when you have to override the global origin? Don't we all love that? That's <laughs> when you got. To, I think for a while, about half the forestry files in BC had an incorrect origin, and the other half were correct. So that made it fun. So if you are not completely confused, you can get into it. Yes. And someone also asked about frame. Here's from a, you click this button, and then we will show you the UFID and the, I forget what the other one was, the secondary, I don't remember, it, it, mm. it fishes out some other attributes. And this is if you want to get to MS Link Fun, you can both read and write MS Links, and that does that. And uh, world file, if you happen to have one, I know that there was, a, I think maybe the Esri folks have a utility that will make um, uh, world files. Yeah. So again, the Esri people have some nice tools for that and we'll apply them if they're there. So those are just a handful of those kinds of options. Um, anything else? Any of uh, Mark Stokes or anybody like that? Any other questions worth... Uh, some, oh, I know. Some people asked, what about if we're going to a GIS format and we want to style it? To Esri world, we don't have anything for you. But for map info, for KML, for PDF, there's stylers for all those things. And if there yeah, is no style for a uh, more rare format, uh, you can uh, style using format attributes. Yes. Yes. And and there is an auto uh, the the uh, demo I showed with the dog parks. We do have the AutoCAD equivalent of that using blocks and a DWG styler transformer. So that's yes. uh, certainly possible as well. I I also have some folks mentioning that MicroStation V8 can have a coordinate system right in there, and that is uh, a good. Um, a good trick to to be aware of. You can certainly have it in the seed file. Um, Regan would have to chime in. I don't think that Safe knows the keys to the car to be able to read and write that automatically. But um, Dave, if you're able to uh, share that with us, that would be great. Uh, we actually we are working on this. We have a PR file, okay. and we we hope to implement it. Yes, we do know that MicroStation uses the same um, library as we do for mm -hmm. coordinate conversion. So if we ever can figure it out, it should should work. Um, really well. So uh, can FME add a tag to a DGN file with a UUID? Um, yes, we can. There's a UUID generator. Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, oh, some people asked, can we go CAD to CAD? If you read from MicroStation, certainly you can write to MicroStation and fix it up. If, yeah. if you had yeah. bad origin files or if you um, wanted to move levels around or split things or add cells, rotate those dog symbols of marks, all that stuff can be done, right, Mark? Absolutely, yes. yes. We have the um, geometry. Uh, my brain's gone. The geometry repairing tool. Oh, the validator. Geometry validator. That's the word. Yes, that's the a great transformer, transformer with its own logo. Yes, that's an See, excellent think, transformer. Uh, if we throw it down, if you if you know your transformers, I didn't actually show that that you can search them over here, but you can also type in here, if I type GV, I think that's what it's known as to its friends, and then you can pop this open, and here we get into all, and you know, many of these are wonderful CAD geometries that are duplicate points, they are, I dare say, a bit corrupt sometimes, and so on, so anyway. Um, they look good, but are not that perfect. 
as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, the, the beauty is only skin deep sometimes. Yeah. Um, so let's see, what else would we say? Somebody asked, uh, somebody from Denmark was tuned in and thanked us for um, showing so much Lego today. So uh, thanks, Danish <laughs> friend, for having that. On that um, subject, I, uh, I, being a, an ex-surveyor, I sort of created a building survey of my house when I moved in and um, used FME to convert it from MicroStation to a 3D format and then send it off and get it printed out. So um, you can uh, you can even use FME to do things like that. Yes, wonderful. So, um, so there's 3D formats we support other than... Um, other than the ones I showed, like specific 3D modeling formats. I was going to tease uh, you about Minecraft, Mark, and I don't think I did say that, right? We could have put... Um, we could have put to Minecraft, yeah. We could have put Vancouver into Minecraft and then uh, somehow had Mark's face on everything there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I get a lot of sympathy from folk here because we're talking CAD people, like we're talking splines and we're not talking big lumps of blocks. Yes. So that's... Anyway, that's my um, beef with Minecraft. <laughs> in the in the lidar case, to get the maximum, there is also a point cloud statistics calculator that gives you means and standard deviations and stuff. So if you don't, if you're afraid a bird is flying over the uh, building at the time, you may not want to take the maximum, but you might want to take the 95th percentile or something like that of the height. So that's possible with the point cloud. Um, statistics calculator, and it runs like stink as well. That's a technical term. I should have tried that, yes. What I did with mine is I uh, clipped the, uh, the point cloud to the yes. uh, building outline and then dropped it to uh, points and just picked out the uh, highest uh, right. elevation. Right, so slightly faster would be do the clip but then run it into a stats calculator yeah. um, and then group it, group that by the... Um, by the building ID, and then you'd get an individual set of stats for each one, and then you can I do a little try bit that. better. Yeah, it'd be fun, a fun one to try. Um, let's see. Some folks from Brazil want to know if we're going to send them Lego bricks afterwards, and uh, sorry, we're not going to. Yes, DXF is totally fine. Somebody's asking. I think the AutoCAD people feel a little bit um, out of place today, but it, it was advertised as a MicroStation one, but yeah. we do love the AutoCAD people. Yes. Let's be very clear. And um, actually, FME... I wrote the DGN and the other co-founder of Safe Don wrote the AutoCAD about the same time 20 years ago. So we have a deep and rich history and tradition with AutoCAD and we could probably do a four-hour session on AutoCAD files. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think unless uh, any of our panelists want to chime in, should we bid everybody adieu? Sure. Let's yep. see. I mean, I think we could get questions all day if we uh, if we sat here, but... Uh, I would love. You know, I just love talking micros. I didn't get to tell my story about Z or Z high and low. I tell you the truth, people. Um, 2D, in MicroStation V7, you had a concept of a 2D file or a 3D file. The 2D file did not store Z or Z values on all the coordinates. And because we're in a PDP-11 environment or we're worried about space, people would often choose the 2D file. Mm -hmm. But somebody along the way figured and realized that in the 2D file, every element has a bounding cube attached to it. Whether you're in 2D or 3D, you have a X min, X max, Y min, Y max, and the Z. Z min, Z max. And here's, what, 8 or 16 perfectly good bytes of space that aren't being used in the 2D file. And I do not lie to you, people put database linkage keys. Basically, they put an ID into the Z low and the Z high so they could join to a database um, without using any more space. And I always think that's one of the most crafty and clever things I ever saw done with a DGN file. Have you heard of that one before, Mark? I haven't, no. That's very inventive. I think that one takes the cake, or maybe it takes the muffin. Or maybe the T-shirt on a muffin. It takes the muffin. So I, I think that's another, a sign that we should end. I see another couple of questions that we can answer quickly. Uh, PDF to shape. We don't have a PDF reader, so that's not uh, possible, unfortunately. No, but, but Hein, uh, please do send us a PDF that you are interested in. Um, I was doing some research with one of the teams in the last couple of weeks, and I would say that there's hope there. Before, there was no hope, oh, but really? now there's a bit of hope. Please send that in. Um, we'd like to give it, a, give it a peek. Yes, we do have a Minecraft writer. Uh, it's actually in SP4. SPA. There's oh, one where is. we need a Minecraft styler, though. Okay. I know that Lena's husband, and I can tell you, Lena, 
Dimitri works at SAFE as well, and he is not addicted to games. It's really part of his job right now. Oh, it's really? Easy. Because it's hard to tell right now. <laughs> <laughs> when he's home at night, late at night, busy working uh, with Minecraft. Oh, it's not playing. It's just he's, for work. He's only working. Okay, good. He's only working. We've actually been working with the National Park Service and some beautiful... Uh, prototype ones, we'll, we'll probably do a webinar on that um, as well, but Dimitri's found that he has to sprinkle bone meal on the trees to get them to grow. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> I thought he's getting into gardening. I was very surprised. <laughs> Apparently it was Minecraft. Yes, yes. So um, someone else is asking about the cost of FME. Um, if you go to our pricing page, let's see, there is a safe.com slash pricing. You can see it there. So just go there. You can see that, Lauren. That that should do that for you. Rhinoceros would be fun um, to do. Rhino is a 3D file format. We don't do it now. Um, actually, we, we didn't talk much about Revit. That's also a, a, a big thing. And IFC, that's sort of higher end CAD. Eventually, Bentley Architecture. We didn't say anything about I models. We're talking with Bentley about that. People asked about project wise. That's Bentley's um, file management thing. We don't have a native support for today. We're building towards it. If you want. Today, you could use our fancy HTTP and authentication stuff to read and write into ProjectWise. We do want to make that easier. If that's of interest to you, let us know. So those are just some other quick things. So um, I think, as Mark says, we could keep going all day, but we've got to eat our muffins. And um, we probably should call that quit. So I think okay. that's it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. OK. Thank Thanks, folks. All right. Stephanie will ask you to shut us down gracefully because I'm scared too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if she can.